Tender greetings, anonymous listener. You know me as Johnny Lichka, back again on the evening of February 13th, 2021. Tonight, I want to share with you an old relic from my notes. A pictographic representation of events in the FGS. I drew this initially in May of 2020, which you know was a couple of months into the deployment of the covert Stein teen operation, but before the release of sophianicmyth.org with FGS 1.5. Although I cannot control how you, the listener, perceives my presentation, I wish to make a light disclaimer. Firstly, I do not represent John Lamb Lash, although I follow his work. I am a free agent, and I don't claim to speak for him. Secondly, I don't claim to be an authority trying to teach the FGS. I'm not trying to interpret it or alter it or lecture upon it as if you were somebody who has never been exposed to the story. And if you haven't read the nine episodes of The Fallen Goddess Scenario from John Lamb Lash as he presents it, I suggest that you go and do so, for this is not intended to be your first encounter. I am presenting this to a specific audience, those of you out there who have a handle on the myth, who have studied it to some degree, and who hold it in your heart's mind. Whether you are fully comfortable with it, whether you memorize it from heart or not, and especially if you don't. This was a test for myself. I wanted to map out the narrative in my own words off the top of my own head, not referring to the written material from Lash. I wanted to see how I would describe events sequentially from memory, which I admit is not 100% accurate. And in light of version 1.5, there are many discrepancies Although some of them are not my fault, the new version 1.5 presents new elements and it reworks some of the older sequencing. So, considering that I had some discrepancies, I assume, now I suspect that some of you out there may be in a similar situation. It's not good enough to assume, hey, I listen to Lash, you listen to Lash, you and I have the same mind. I heard it, you heard it, we both heard the same thing and therefore hold the same ideas. No, it might be instructive to compare notes and perhaps you may wish to Go ahead and pause here and map out the narrative so far as you grasp it to see what you're able to produce. That's something I would like to see. As a final footnote, I want to let you know that I consider this term organic narrative sequencing rather than rigid linear sequencing. I have some notion that linear time is an illusion, and it might seem counterintuitive to sort of list the, de the details in any kind of sequence. However, you know that the narrative does have some kind of sequence. Obviously, you read part one before you read part two. Part eight must be established before there is a part nine and some of the details in the story are described consequentially. Sophia does A, B happens as a result. So just keep that term in mind, organic narrative sequence, apposite to a linear sequence. And without further ado, I'll go ahead and tear through these notes 
pointing out where I was wrong, and I invite you to do the same. I've punctuated separate events or scenarios, scenes within the scenario, with these artistic brackets. Each bracket openly encloses one bullet point in the narrative. To begin, I name the three primary characters, Sophia, Thalete, and Christos. They reside in the Pleroma along with the other aeons. Zooming out, I place the Pleroma specifically in our galaxy which you can picture with the spiral limbs, noting that all this is the setting prior to the appearance of the Anthropos template. Although the FGS does not explicitly state this detail, I infer that there are likely other experiments underway or unfolding in other parts of the galaxy. Correct me if I'm wrong, but can you not infer that the other Aeons, aside from Sophia herself, has generated and continue to generate other experiments, other templates aside from our own. Next, I briefly describe the details of the generation of the Anthro template. To my recollection, Sophia describes, uh, Lash describes Sophia as being a young Aeon with the relative age of 14 as opposed to the elder Thalete, whose age is not defined as far as I know. Sophia and Thalete encode by dance into novelty provided by the originator, the Anthropos template, anointed with aroma by Christos, ejected into the galactic arms, which embeds in the Orion Nebula, to seed in worlds, here I wrote ten when I know it should be nine. And I draw a sphere representing each strain that ultimately fails. This leads to the initial conditions of the fall itself. There she is, still in the Pleroma, observing these nine experiments, and this inspires her intention, Sophia's protonoia. I believe the legacy version of the narrative mentions that she first conceives of the trimorphic protonoia, which means three-body original thought, where she envisions a perfect setting for the Anthropos, a planet with an orbiting satellite orbiting a star, sun, moon, and earth. Also, she imagines different avataric intervention scenarios in which she would have intervened into the previous experiments and even considers how she might intervene to correct a future experiment. Sophia sets events in motion when she dreams unilaterally, that is, alone, without a consort. I infer here that this is unbalanced, or she loses balance, note the question mark, Slowly drifting, she draws out of the core, separates. Three obvious errors I'll point out here. I begin with the triad of aeons in the Pleroma, but the current and legacy versions include this, introduce the story with the originator. Secondly, and this is more of a correction, but Lash no longer considers Christos as the name of an aeon, Rather, he is replaced by the symbiont. Then, as I mentioned already, instead of observing ten worlds unfold, Sophia only witnesses nine prior to her plunge. The Fall of the Wisdom Goddess Drifting away from the core, out into the limbs, at the point of severance or separation, she snaps and plunges, perhaps as a glob of honey, as it breaks off, being poured from the lid of a jar. Violently plunges, a streaming torrent she of organic light, horizontally through the galactic limbs. While, plung while plunging, she passes near the Orion Nebula, like magnetized lint. She draws some of its components, which are female, 
into her bodily substance. And this event is itself called the gender rift. The next event is called the impact. I've apparently taken creative liberty with this page. The bulk of my description here may not fit at all, but the visualization of pouring honey from a jar is so familiar to me personally, I instinctively used it as I needed some way of visualizing what physically happens to her. Though I could be entirely wrong, then although I think this fits in the legacy version, the updated version of the FGS places the event of the gender rift at a later sequence in the story, happening after the impact and in a different manner. You and I are just examining objectively this imperfect production of my mind. Perhaps yours faces similar obstacles when attempting to wrap your head around this complex narrative. Sophia's Impact a bit of chaos on this page, perhaps fitting. Reading the swirling bullet points counterclockwise, her creative slash dreaming power interacts with the Dima, which is dense elementar elementary matter arrays, and spontaneously produces the Archons, a locust-like inorganic creature. Sophia bestows a portion of her creative power the Archons construct a protoplanetary system, their habitat prior to, or to Earth's formation. Additionally, Yaldabaoth appears amongst the Horde as the Lord, Ar Lord Archon, called Samael, Blind God, the False Creator Deity, also called the Demiurge. To quote from the Bible, he declares, I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Nagamati says something to the extent that he declares himself the creator of all he sees, which is kind of ironic considering he is blind. To which Sophia responds with her Magnificat, accidentally spelled Magnificant, in which she declares those words, You are mistaken, Samael. There is an immortal child of light who existed before you and will appear before your spectral forms, forms and trample you to scorn. At the consummation of your works, you will be pounded as potter's clay is pounded into a lump, and your entire defect will be as if it had never been. And that's just a rough paraphrase. All of this falls under the larger bracket of the event of the first Archontic system, which I call monotonously Archontic system number one. I deliberately number it for distinction purposes. It is a planetary system centered around a proto-Saturn, represented by the hexagon, which appears as a feature of the Saturn in our solar system today. But note, this is all prior to the appearance of Sun, Moon, Earth, and humanity but the unbalanced system collapses, dot, dot, dot. At this point, I need to review the 1.5 version because I'm unsure when sequentially, not stressing too much over linear sequencing, when, when Yaldabaoth actually appears. So I put him and Sophia's counter Magnificat in their own brackets to be expanded upon. This treatment is more of a general overview. I'm aware that Lash has recently protested in a forum post or on a Q&A that Sophia does not imagine the Archons into existence. And note, I don't use that term, imagine. I wouldn't here dare comment on exactly what the mechanism of their spontaneous abiogenic appearance is, like the Akari insects, of which you find zero pictures no original documentation, but rather paraphrase reports of such experiments that were initially conducted by Andrew Cross and even Michael Faraday. So I have to look again at 1.5, but generally the description is not, as I recall, clear. I'm not the only one who has 
had difficulty describing exactly what happens and how to Lash's satisfaction, and that may be something he wants to review. When the student struggles, the professor can only change what he says or restate things clearer. In any case, don't get hung up on my attempts here. Let them instruct and guide to the correct view, if possible. I'm all ears. Here, I briefly reca recap the events thus far, which I feel helps to see it all on one page. It began in the Pleroma. The Rome slash Anthropos template emerge, and from that emerges A1 through A9. Sophia conceives of the trimorphic protonoia. She plunges, shears the Anthropos template, makes an impact in the Dima, produces the archons, they construct archontic system number one, which collapses, dot, 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 and then the sun appears. A plasmic eddy enters the zone of Sophia and the archons. Sophia fills the sun with light, a bracket for further elaboration. Sun, called Sabayat and Zoe, Sophia's flame-born daughter. The Archons reconstruct their habitual system centered around the sun, and this is Archontic system number two, still prior to moon and earth. Below my description is a bit vague. Sophia recalls her intention subconsciously. Note the question mark. Her material substance body coalesces into material elements, forming the moon and eventually dot dot dot. Before moving on, let me straighten out some issues I have. Again, the shearing of the Anthropos template, or the gender riff, occurs at a different sequence and with different detail in version 1.5. To briefly compare, there is an entirely new element in the story, which no one had when I wrote this, Sophia's daughter cell, an event in which she splits into two cells from the Ouroboros, the snake eating her own tail that contains the archons, and a butterfly-like sperm cell that travels outside the impact zone towards the Orion Nebula. It is that butterfly-like Thing that shears the template. I'm not giving a fair treatment of this event. My purpose here is to examine my initial take on the legacy version, retrospectively. Lash also now calls the sun Savitri. I will note here that in both the legacy and updated versions, there are but two and only ever two archontic systems. By some strange literary stylistic approach, Lash describes the collapse happening twice, and subsequently the reconstruction twice. Once at the end of part six, in which part six the, the system collapses and is built again. And again he describes it in the middle of part seven. So the unfamiliar reader might assume that there were in all three archontic systems, two of which collapse. If I'm wrong on that note, and I'd prefer this detail, I'd prefer that this detail uh, to hear it from the main man himself, straighten it out for me. Um, but I stand by it so far that there were and only ever two archontic systems. Then you might pick up on some ambiguous wording in the final paragraph of this page. Sophia drifting there in the galactic limbs with the archons doing their thing. Quote, Sophia recalls her, her intention. The word subconsciously is my embellishment. It may not fit. Please note the question mark, but I will say that in version 1.5, Lash repeats this detail something like five or six times throughout the story. And Sophia returns her gaze to the Orion Nebula. And Sophia returns her gaze to the Anthropos templates. She returns her gaze to the Orion Nebula. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I'm like, okay, we get it. Does she just periodically do this for untold millennia? I accept it. There's not much to read into it deeply. It is her focus. 
She gets distracted, perhaps, refocuses, repeat. The story gains most traction, in my opinion, towards the final chapter of the first iteration. Her material, substan bo- her material substance body coalesces into material elements, forming the moon and eventually earth. Now the trimorphic protonoia is complete. Sun, moon, planet. These events I have, I leave unelaborated with fitting titles in open brackets, the terrestrialization, the Christic intercession, the Thonian romance involving the guy and she and the Orion men, and did I spell that right, guy and she, with perhaps more events I missed, leading up to the archontic intrusion, the birth of Abrahamic religion that sets the stage for the world situation today, with the issue of Semitism, the phenomena of Gnosis, and Sophia's correction. And there's where I left it. So as I mentioned in the beginning, Christos is essentially replaced by the symbiont, so you may call it, perhaps, the symbiotic intercession. This closing page begs for more elaboration that would not fit for this basic overview. What I've done or attempted here is merely to outline what is, compa- what is compacted into version 1.0, now 1.5, the story arc, if you will. I had been meaning to share this for a while, but selfishly wanted to present it as polished as I could, ironic for being a blotchy scribble of ink. I'd just gotten my fountain pen and was, was starting to learn how to use it. Many things I didn't mention, such as Melchizedek, although he's implied by the birth of Abrahamic religion, Shakyamuni, the historical Buddha, Tezcatlipoca, Sophia's first identical node as Justine in the novel by the Marquis de Sade. Lash has given ample description on all these events and more. Good luck finding it in any easy access sequence. Lash has released a unit on Nemeta titled The Story Arc of the FGS. And when I first saw the title, I thought, great, now I don't have to do this. But upon reading it, it contains a meager 15 words under the bracket 1.0. And I quote 1.0, the home story, released on sophianicmyth.org. Nine expanded episodes, currently in conversion into book form period. 2.0 has 10 paragraphs, and 3.0 goes on to about 15 paragraphs, and each section following it gets bigger and bigger. 1.0 here gets 15 words that point you elsewhere to get the full story, and uh, I hate to say it, but that seems a little insufficient. Albeit Lash did tremendous work last summer, the summer of 2020, bringing us the updated version of FGS, so you be thankful for that. But I tell you, it's bulky. It comes in about 9 to 10 emails that comprise a total of 26,000 words, including summarized expansions and descriptions of terms. I must say you are brave indeed, anonymous listener, for for committing to learning the story. I'm still learning it myself, and perhaps there are things you can teach me. But let no one say this is a simple and easy task. I'm confident with what I do know about the story, whilst at the same time I return to it, and each time I do discover something new. Thanks for watching. I'm out here reaching out to you so that you might reach out to someone too.